This game is rated M and is intended for mature audiences. The many months I had spent in various hospitals came to an end and I began to recuperate at home. That was when the first signs of the change began to appear. Apparently I was saying uncharacteristic things to my parents. I was talking and behaving in ways I usually wouldn't, almost as if I had become a completely different person. My parents were incredulous at first, half suspecting some kind of elaborate prank, but as they knew, I wasn't exactly a practical joker by nature. I wasn't consciously aware of any of this. My alternate personality came at the price of gaps in my memory. Maybe I was sleepwalking? Or turning into a different person without even realizing it? Wait, 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 wait. She got her second personality after her heart transplant? What? Um... I hope they explain this. A doctor diligently studied my brain activity and asked me all sorts of questions. But in the end, he could only offer a vague conclusion. This phenomenon can't be explained by modern medicine. Ultimately, the adults decided that the powerful psychological impact of losing a friend in front of my eyes had led to changes in my personality. But I didn't really care either way. I responded with a disinterested, Oh, is that so? Good to hear. The gaps in my memories became frequent. And as time passed, they grew longer, harder to ignore. The other me who showed up in these chunks of lost time seemed unsurprisingly competent. Or surprisingly competent. From what I gathered, she was much more sociable than I was, and a lot better at schoolwork as well. One night I noticed dinner was a little extravagant. Dad smiled across the table and told me it was a reward for trying so hard at my studies lately. It was kind of a strange experience, but I didn't really mind. I mean, if things were going smoothly, who cared if I remembered doing the things I was being praised for or not? As this pattern continued, I found myself acquiring a number of friends as well. Of course, I'd gotten to know them during the blank spaces of my memories, so I didn't really know what sort of people they were. Without any effort on my part, lots of people began greeting me in a friendly tone on the road to school. After saying hi, they'd usually ask, What's wrong? Not feeling so good today? Seems like they saw the usual me as the sick Michiru, and the person who showed up in those blank periods of lost time as the normal, cheerful Michiru. Did they forget that you used to be very... Unsocial? I was lying down in my room one evening when Dad stopped up by to check up on me. I just want to point out, she's... I think Mitru's canon age in the present time is 16. Maybe 17. So she's she's gone through all of this before she... while she's still a teenager. It's... It's very sad. Have you forgotten what I used to be like, too? Hmm. Welcome, Goris. Oh, her canon age is 16. Okay. I knew she was, I think, second year. She's second year in high school, but I also know Japanese high school is different. Not knowing what else to do, I forced a strained smile onto my face. Oh, no. Oh, this is bad. They think that Happy Michiru is the real Michiru, and that's... Oh. That's gonna already hurt her self-worth. That's already terrible. Smiling, Dad left the room and closed the door behind him. And all of a sudden, an image flashed into my head. An image of a girl frozen in flight. It was the girl who'd left me so abruptly. My best friend who had abandoned this world. Her final goodbye echoed inside my head. Rebounding off the walls of my skull... The word was terribly sharp. Every time it clanged against the bone, it felt as though someone was drilling me open from the inside. <laughs> Trembling with fear and pain, I drove into my bed with a f ins I dove- <laughs> I took out my car, drove into my bed- <laughs> I dove into my bed in search of refuge. Greasy sweat broke out onto my forehead, and I swallowed the first of the pills that my doctor had prescribed, pulled the blanket over my head, and squeezed my eyes shut. If I can get past this, I'll become the cheerful Michiru again. I can't break down now. I silently repeated those words to myself. And soon enough, drowsiness wrapped me up in a thick, sticky cocoon, blanket and all. Finally, I'll be able to sleep. I'll pull through after all. It was just as those thoughts were running hazily through my mind. Just as I stood on the border between reality and dreams, when I heard the unfamiliar voice from outside my blanket. Uh, why are we getting the super intense music now? 
I didn't understand in the slightest how this was supposed to be all right. Hearing the voice of some strange woman as I tried to fall asleep really didn't seem to qualify. What the butts is going on? The instant I heard those words, I felt my heart pound violently. A sharp, white-hot pain spread from my chest throughout my entire body as if traveling through my blood vessels. Oh. I remembered the doctor offhandedly mentioning a phenomenon known as cellular memory. In rare cases, patients receiving heart transplants had seemed to inherit aspects of the previous owner's tastes or memories. Um, what? I am like 98% sure that is not a thing in real life. <laughs> is this what they're trying to do? We got she got the alternate personality from the the owner of the heart that transplanted into her. What the Yeah, this doesn't happen. <laughs> oh, that's right. You did say this route was the least grounded in reality. Yeah, okay. You know, this makes for an interesting story to be sure, but and you know what? I don't. I don't really have a problem with this, to be honest. This this game already kind of straddles the line of reality to begin with, so I don't really see that big of an issue with this. It's just it was not what I was expecting. <laughs> but I can get behind this. Maybe it was true. Maybe it had happened to me. No, this wasn't anything so minor. The former owner's entire personality had slipped inside me, complete and distinct from my own. And now she was talking to me, declaring herself my best friend. I wonder if this is gonna go in a creepy direction. If it's like her, oh, the girl who like had the heart that Michiru was uh, had transplanted into her was actually evil. <laughs> that would be kind of interesting. I mean, that would also be kind of the the, the cheap way to do it. But uh, you never know. I wasn't about to put up with that. Another best friend was the last thing I wanted. <laughs> Throwing off the covers, my pulse pounding in fear of my own body, I shouted at the disembodied voice. Now that she has the new heart, is she still in danger of massive heart attacks, or was that just her old heart? I couldn't even tell if this was reality or some insane nightmare. My terror escalated into frenzy and ripped out clumps of my her of her hair, I don't know how that would work, out of my own hair, bit my own arms, and kicked things all over the room until my feet bled. Michiru, you gotta stop. This is you're, this is no time to have a temper tantrum, but it wasn't enough. I grabbed a box cutter from my desk. I don't like where this is going! Grasped it tightly in my hands and listened carefully, trying to figure out where the voice was coming from. Why do you- Why does everybody just have box cutters around? This is not something that most people have in their room. First Yumiko and now Michiru. The voice was the cause of this pain. It flowed through my body with the blood thumping out of my heart, bringing agony with it. I had to get that voice out of my body. Well, no! No, 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 no. Oh, that's not good. With that thought, I cut at my wrist with the blade. Don't do that! Trying to drain the voice out of my, out of me alone with my blood. But no matter where, how my arm bled, the voice remained securely inside my body. In that case, I had no choice. I needed to uproot it directly. I needed to get rid of that foreign entity pulsing away inside me. Pointed the blade at my own chest and stabbed as hard as I could. No! <laughs> it wasn't the sharpest blade, but it broke the skin easily enough. Slowly, it gouged its way through my flesh. Just a little fervor, and I'd reach the heart. The invasion would soon be over. I'd be rid of the voice. I felt relief washing over me. But just then, I smelled that distinctive mixture of cigarettes and strange women, and realized my father had entered the room. Well, you were screaming bloody murder. <laughs> Before I knew it, my room had become a disaster scene. The shattered and torn remnants of my belongings stained dark red with splashes of fresh blood. That's gotta be... one of... the most frightening and disturbing things you could walk into. You, as a father, walk into your daughter's room to see that she's stabbing herself as hard as she can in the chest. I can't even imagine that. The box cutter fell from my hands and hit the ground with a dull funk. The sound abruptly brought me back to reality. Dad's familiar face was so contorted that he looked like an entirely different person. I had to smile, had to reassure him. But different words came out of my mouth. Dad hugged me closely for the first time in many years. 
but it was very different from that girl's embrace. Even though he was holding me close, I could feel a vast chasm looming between us. Well, great, Michiru. Now we need to get a third heart for you, and now you'll get another personality. That very night, I was admitted to a new hospital. Not that I had any choice in the matter. It was very quiet there. All of the patients were tranquil and sedate. Sometimes I felt as though I'd wandered into some forgotten corner of the afterlife. Dang, this is really intense and really sad, but also really good. Like, see, thi this... Like, when I played Grisea, I was promised there would be guns and blood and action. We've gotten remarkably little of those. But these parts here where we delve deep into the characters and why they are the way they are, it's so fascinating and really good. But doggone, I want more guns and blood and action. Come on! <laughs> I was promised those. <laughs> there were times when I found their constant, unchanging smiles frightening, but I got the idea soon enough. Basically, it was a place where you could live without getting tangled up in your emotions. You could pass the time peacefully, thinking about nice things. To put the opposite spin on it, in that place you weren't allowed to think about anything else. What is this, the thought police? The medicine they gave me there made my mind feel pleasantly clear. My other personality stopped emerging entirely. It was like living inside a tightly closed music box. Boring, but very peaceful. I stayed in there for a long time. Oh, uh, it's probably a mental ward. I didn't talk with anyone. For the most part, I just stood quietly by the wall, trying not to stand out trying to shrink myself down to the point where the world would overlook me. But one day, I tripped on the leg of a chair and fell to the ground. That had never happened before, so I wasn't sure what to do. Fortunately, no one insulted me or yelled angrily. Instead, a few patients nearby put their hands to their mouths and giggled softly in amusement. I liked hearing that sound. And lying there on the ground, an idea occurred to me. Maybe if I fell on purpose, I could make people laugh again. Oh! See? This is why she's so... Clumsy. Ah, <laughs> clumsy? <laughs> the next day I tripped again. Again, the people who noticed laughed a little. The day after that, I deliberately spilled a glass of water, and once more I heard the pleasant sound of laughter. Emboldened by my success, I spoke. <laughs> I'm playing. I've played the two roots with the least action. Well, gosh darn it. But I don't want to play the Machina or Amine roots. Maybe I might do the Yumiko route. Even though most of the action is in the sequels. Okay, okay. Interesting. More people laughed than before. Their voices were warm and gentle. I'd found a way to make myself useful. By devoting myself to clowning around, I could at least make others smile. No! I knew it! I knew she was pretending to be... I mean, again, she's clearly not an academic. I knew she was pretending to be stupider than she actually was. From that day on, I acted out a sillier version of myself, an exaggerated funny caricature of me, and I sustained myself on a sugary sweet diet of laughter. Alright then, from now on I'd go this way of life. The pretending didn't bother me. It was worth it to do something for other people. It was worth it to have something to live for. Oh, and this kind of explains the uh, pretend dates as well, because she's basically pre plain pretend her whole life. Hmm. Fascinating. Still doesn't explain why Yuji's really doing it, going along with it, or why he thinks it's acceptable. Nobody had appreciated me before because I wanted them to be like the real me. Problem was, the real me wasn't any good, so I might as well just pretend. I don't agree with that part, Michiru. All I had to do was act out the most convenient role, force out the most convenient emotions, become someone who put a smile on people's faces. And that's how Michiru became a clown. <laughs> Even if that meant the real me disappeared entirely, I didn't care. I was a little anxious about whether someone as stupid as me could even act convincingly. But I had no choice but to try. Among the patients, I gained a niche as the weird but funny girl. As I grew into the role, I became more lively. In time, the doctors decided I was on my way to a full recovery and politely ejected me from the hospital. I'd lost my place in the world, but my parents soon found me another. Apparently they'd heard somewhere or other about the special school that only gathered students with complicated circumstances. I was enrolled in Mahama Academy soon after my return. <laughs> Do they have, like, commercials for it? Like, is your child weird? Do they not belong in regular school? Well, there's a school for you, Mahama Academy. <laughs> I, I am, I'm very, um, interested about that. 
I kept right on playing the clown in this school. I thought it would be nice to keep everyone laughing. And in fact, that's just how things turned out. The days rolled past pleasantly enough, for the most part. But every once in a while, I'd abruptly remember that this, too, was nothing but an artificial make-believe world. When everyone laughed together, I wasn't smiling from the heart. And over time, my uncertainty grew. I didn't want to lose what I'd found here, but I didn't want to grow dependent on it. The more I pretended to be someone I wasn't, the less I understood what I wanted to do. Did an imposter like me really belong here in the first place? It felt like I was living in an ant lion's pit. Well, what? <laughs> there was nowhere else for me to go. No way out of the rut. All I could do was struggle not to fall. Can we give this poor girl a hug? She really deserves it. Having delivered her lengthy story in one uninterrupted sitting, Michiru finally pauses, her face lined with fatigue. I wouldn't say that was the shortest backstory ever. That took over an hour. I mean, granted, it had nothing compared to Sachi's backstory, but that one was also super duper long. Oh. Also, we never got a CG of Michiru and her and girl standing next to each other. Lame. Hmm. Oh man, I want guns. <laughs> now hold on. In that in in, in the intro song, there was one hundred percent a CG of Machina aiming a shotgun at somebody. I I know what I saw. <laughs> Also, dog on it. I I really wanted girl to be part of the organization Yuji was part of. That would have been such an amazing twist. But I don't somehow I don't think they can go in that direction anymore. <laughs> dog on it. But I don't want to do Makina's route. Can I do Makina's route without actually like having a romantic relationship with Makina? Because I, I don't think I would be able to do the route if it's like there were... For even Forget even lewd scenes. Even if there were scenes of us like hardcore making out with her. Like, uh-uh, I can't do that. Nope. Okay, well, we're not doing Machina's route then. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> Rats. Dog on it. That's, that's, that's frustrating. So we'll, we'll probably never get to know the backstory of Machina holding the shotgun. I'll, I'll make up my own Machina route, <laughs> and it'll be better. Yuji's <laughs> reaction? Well, thanks for telling me that. I'm gonna have to go to work. <laughs> Scratching my head, I search for the words Michiru needs to hear. They prove surprisingly easy to find. What you need right now isn't this fatalistic pessimism. It's medical treatment. Your problem's too complex to you f to face on your own. Thank you, Yuji! Way to be the voice of reason on occasion. Go to a hospital and have the professionals diagnose you. Then work slowly and surely toward getting better. I think I understand the general outline of the situation. The memories of her organ donor have influenced Michiru's mind. Or so she thinks, at least. It's not a common phenomenon. Uh, that's that's literally an impossible phenomenon, actually. But apparently it's not entirely unprecedented either. No, it is. <laughs> Whatever the case may be, what the girl needs is appropriate treatment in an appropriate setting. Very true. <laughs> I strongly recommend it. I doubt they'll keep you there longer than a week for an examination like this, and I'm worried about you. Why would I lie? I didn't dislike that make-believe game of yours. I probably could have found another way to occupy myself, but spending time with you was, well, enjoyable. I'm not lying. How many times do you want to make me say this exact same thing? 
Considering how bad this girl's self-worth is, I understand why she has a hard time believing it. Also, when did you de decide to start dyeing your hair? Did that happen in the hospital? Or afterwards? <laughs> Were you blonde in high school? No, that surely it must have happened after she left the hospital, but before she came to Mahama. I want to see Michiru's normal hair color, honestly. Because I feel like the blonde hairstyle is a little overblown. I don't want you to disappear on me, Michiru. I'd find that unpleasant. This is seriously the last time I'm going to repeat myself. Because the time I spent with you wasn't half bad. You could have put it a little nicer than that. I take Michiru by the shoulders and look her straight in the eyes. You're living in the present, Michiru. Don't let yourself get caught up in the past. You can't fix it. What's done can't be undone. But the future is still yours to shape. Incredibly obvious, yes. But it doesn't hurt to keep that in mind. Right now, your future is on the line. You need to take control of it. With that said, I kiss Michiru briefly on the lips. She turns down her face in embarrassment and hesitates for a moment, studying the floor as if deciding which words to pick off from the ground. Do you know, that was really nice of Yuji right there. That was some good, solid advice, and that was a nice thing for him to do. In the end, she chooses extremely simple ones. Sometimes the simple words are the best. Extreme, extremely simple, but not half bad. A pretty respectable choice, actually. Yay! Add a girl, Michiru. True. Leave the arrangements with the hospital to me. I'll get something worked out. You're not a nuisance. But if you're feeling guilty anyway, you can show me your gratitude once you're feeling better. No. No, no, no. We don't need to do that. No. Don't be an idiot. <laughs> Thank you! <laughs> Normally I don't like ru rude Yuji. Ruji, but, you know, that was precedented. Oh wait, I, I didn't read that. Can we leave early in the morning? I don't mind, but why? She probably don't want Machina being like, Hey, Chiru Chiru, why are you going to the hospital? <laughs> yes! <laughs> no, that's when I run! I can't ever run at a different time. Sure, not a problem. For now, you should get some rest. Aww. Okay, just... It, it didn't really explain why she fix, is fixated on tsundere's. Like, I guess you could be like, oh, well, she wants to be the class clown, and she thought the tsundere personality would do... It, it does, they didn't really touch on that. She delivers this line in such a subdued, quavery tone of voice that I can't help but laugh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got it. All right, then. I'll see you tomorrow. She still has my favorite sprites out of anyone in the game. Ah, well. Looks like I'm going to end up indebted to Chizuru yet again. <laughs> Uh-oh! How long is she going to keep being Principal? <laughs> I spend my walk to the principal's office, ruminating on Michiru's story. Her tale's still fragmentary, and the plot's tangled. Deciphering it is going to be difficult. Might even turn out to be one of those books you can spend a lifetime on without ever finding a conclusive interpretation. But even so, I've decided to keep turning the pages. Why? Because it feels like the thing to do. Simple as that. Alright, back to Yuji's room. Oh yeah. I like Yuji's room because that's where there's the big fridge. After we parted yesterday, Michiru slept soundly for the night. Sharing the burden she'd carried in secret for so long, even momentarily, must have brought her some relief. I explained the situation to Chizuru and had her arrange for an investigative stray into a nearby hospital. A stray? I can read investigative stay in a nearby hospital. Also, we now owe her a lot of money. Of course, this involved enduring a great deal of sarcasm and sniping, but our principal wasn't about to refuse to help a student in need of medical attention. I'm sorry, but... Chizuru knows Michiru's backstory. I mean, you, you have to in order to get enrolled in Mahama Academy. You have to tell the principal what your deal is. So she knew about this all along, and she was just like, 
la 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 la, nothing's wrong. And then Yuji's like, hey, I found out about this too that you already know. She's like, oh, well, we better do something about that. It's like, come on, Principal. You, you get it together. I can't say whether she was moved more by my more by pseudo parental affection or a professional concern for her responsibilities, but I suppose it hardly matters. Early the next morning, I prepare to see off Michiru. Normally, I'd be pulling on my sweats and heading out for a run right about now, but today I'm skipping that. An exercise routine is only meaningful when you follow it faithfully. There's no point in doing it at all if you take days off. Um. You can take one day off. I thought you were driving. Oh, wait, no. Yuji don't have a car or a license. He has to be driven everywhere by his <laughs> by his boss, by Jan. But I understand that some things are more important than a training schedule. True. Some things can withstand a day's neglect. Others can be lost in a heartbeat. Difficult as it can be to accurately identify the difference, prioritizing them appropriately is absolutely crucial. I head upstairs to Michiru's room and knock lightly on the door, but there's no answer. She's most likely still preparing for her departure. It's generally understood that women take time to get themselves ready to go anywhere. Deciding it best not to rush the girl, I patiently stand by in front of the room for some time. Um, she's not overdosing again, right? I really hope she's not. How are you going to stick Michiru into a hospital if she wouldn't want to? She... she does! Or maybe maybe she didn't want to before. Oh, uh, I guess I guess that's fair. But me, I find Michiru just wanted to, or has at least been willing to for quite a while. Maybe not. I don't know. This game is so long; it's hard to remember what happened and when. Finally, deciding that we need to get going, I call out to her. I call out her name, Michiru. Michiru. But again, there's no response. I suppose it's a little early for her. Maybe she's still sleeping. Michiru, everything all right in there? At last, there's a quiet answer from inside the room. Why is she, why is she wearing her cute date dress to the hospital? Strikes me as a bit of a strange request, but I obey. Michiru, Michiru, Michiru. After repeating her name numerous times, I hear a rummaging sound from within. A moment later, Michiru eases open the door, dragging along the small suitcase as if it were loaded with bricks. The girl's wearing some strangely dressy clothing. What's with the outfit? She wants to look cute. Aww. She knows I like that alternate outfit of hers. It, it is a nice one. Sure, but you're only going for a week or so, right? You'll be back soon enough. What's the point? Well, I definitely don't understand these females' hearts. Oh, who's they? <laughs> Sakaki, huh? <sighs> Michiru pouts a little, a clear shade of melancholy in her eyes. Seeing her take this attitude, I feel a twinge of reluctance myself. Maybe the girl could stay. My help might be enough to pull her through the worst of it. I don't recommend that! No, she, I think she should get professional help. Hmm, well... Oh my gosh! We get a decision! Guys, you have no idea how rare choices are in this game. It's absolutely insane. Saying goodbye. That's not ominous or anything. Well, I'm pretty sure every route only actually has one choice to make, so what we choose here will determine whether we get the good ending or the bad ending, most likely. I'm pretty sure every route only has one choice. I mean, out of these two, don't leave after all, let's stay together, or how about a kiss before you we you go. I mean, it's pretty clear that if we, if we don't get her the help that she needs from the hospital, that things aren't going to end well, that they're going to get worse. <laughs> So, I mean, I hate to I hate to quote this, but to quote a very famous line from a very famous game, how about a kiss? <laughs> how about a kiss before you go? No, just a kiss. <laughs> you don't have to make that face at me! <laughs> the way you put that slightly pisses me off. 
<laughs> oh, was that her Yuji face? Oh, that's a good one. Oh, who's that? Oh, hi, Sachi! We're just about to kiss! I mean, Sachi's up and at him at 4 a.m., cleaning everything. いえ、今日は珍しく朝早く目が覚めてしまいましたので、ワックス掛けでもと思いまして、放射の他に函館駅をぶっかけては吹きを繰り返していたところです。オッケー。そうなの。お二人こそ揃ってどうなさったんですか
Like, it's pretty clear what's happening. Good enough? <laughs> I mean, what wouldn't Amine do? Michiru's cheeks are slightly red, but Sachi gives no outward indication out of curiosity or suspicion. <laughs> Why, thank you. How gracious of you. <laughs> what does that even mean? <laughs> the taxi's here. Don't worry, BD Joe is the best taxi driver ever. Michiru Mich takes a deep breath, then turns to face me once more. Aww. And with those words, she bows her head deeply. Cut it out. Coming from you, that just feels weird. <laughs> あ。あ。Bye-bye. Aw, that's cute. Sachi and Michiru always did get along, like, together really well. Alright, see you later. Oh no, why is she sad? Oh, well, she's sad because she's leaving her friends, that's why. With a small wave, Michiru leaves the school, dragging her suitcase behind her. Is she walking there? <laughs> I thought there was a taxi. <laughs> Is it my imagination? I'm pretty sure you just triggered the bad ending. I hope not. Don't know about that. You're probably just overthinking things. I tried to reassure Sachi, but the fact of the matter is I'm in agreement with her observation. Michiru left as though expecting never to see us again. After Michiru finally disappears in the distance, Sachi and I make our way back to the dormitory. They better not have... <laughs> it was pretty clear to me that... Ha get, having to go to the hospital to get looked at would be the best choice. I think it would be the best choice IRL. Maybe they're like, oh man, you just triggered the bad ending, but you have to play for 12 more hours before you actually figure out if you got it or not. In a reversal of those summer weeks, this time Mitra is the only one who's vanished from this place. It's going to be a little dull in their absence. Guess I'll have to find some way to kill the time. <laughs> 